Thank you. Much. Yeah, I appreciate it very much. My parents be very proud of that introduction. So I appreciate the, the introduction. So I'm going to talk about the uh, uh, clinical trials from DRCRNet and how they relate to clinical practice. And what you're going to hear is sort of my opinion and take on these things. So please forgive me. And I would love to open this up for discussion uh, toward the end, because I think it's not necessarily what the studies found, but sort of our interpretation of how they've become into clinical practice today. Here are my financial disclosures for the presentation. So the key points, I'm going to address the numerous topics addressed by the DRCR net. I'll summarize their finding and I'll discuss some of their future protocols as they relate to practice. And the DRCR net, or the, I should say the DRCR retina network now, has done so many wonderful studies in the area of diabetes. And now they've expanded beyond the realm of diabetes into uh, uh, obviously AMD um, for uh, photography and, and assessing diabetic retinopathy. They're even looking at um, conversations you have, uh, they did look for it with, with, uh, in the studies, in conversations you had with the patient in the office and whether that would decrease the hemoglobin A1C in the patient. So they've done all of these various trials in the past few years, which have really been quite helpful and, and contributory to the literature. And these are some of the studies that are, are ongoing now. Um, they're looking at um, intravitreal gas for vitreal macular traction syndrome. They're going to look at some genetical studies. They're even looking at a photobiomodulation study using light therapy to reduce the, the uh, effect of DME in some patients. So really exciting and innovative trials have uh, go, uh, gone under. But probably the landmark study that people have talked about the most is protocol I. And this was really helpful from us to help it better explain sort of the expectations behind DME treatment with our patients. In this study, patients were randomized to either prompt or deferred a laser with ranibizumab as treatment uh, in comparison to trimcinolone, as well as uh, just uh, uh, a sham uh, laser alone in this population. And what they found essentially was that the number of treatments really decreased over the, the years as you go along. And this is kind of the first, I think, really interesting finding we saw from any diabetic uh, study regarding DME, that the number of treatments go down as the patient gets treated over time. And so this gives our patient some reassurance, you know, you by year four and year five, essentially you're doing on average on a PRN fashion between zero and one injection in those patients. So really from the patient standpoint and the provider standpoint, this provide a lot of good data for our understanding of how patients get treated in a PRN basis for this practice. One of the other most interesting analyses of, of this has been this um, sort of swimming lane approach that basically within the first three months of treating a patient, in protocol I with anti-VEGF treatment, that you can actually figure out what their final vision is going to be. And so they presented this post hoc analysis of protocol I uh, to show that in after 12 weeks of therapy, essentially you ended up in this single lane for which you never really changed or, or deviated. And what I can tell you is that this is not necessarily true. And actually, I published two studies, both from Rise and Ride and Vivid and Vista where I looked at um, the limited early response, meaning the, the lack of visual acuity or OCT at three months after initiating therapy. And what we found essentially was in protocol I, while you had those swimming lanes, in rise and ride, you did not have those lanes at all. And in, 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 with a more intensive treatment, you actually could get past those lanes. And this is actually the paper we published also in Vivid and Vista. So essentially that idea of swimming lanes isn't necessarily true, that more intensive therapy will get you past those lanes and allow you to restore the vision in those patients. Probably the more interesting find, a recent study has been around protocol S, and I think this is very controversial because panrel laser had been the mainstay of, of treatment back you know, 30, 40 years now. And I remember as a resident, um, uh, I was at the Jocelyn Diabetes Center in Boston, and we used to look at photographs from patients treated with laser 30, 40 years uh, you know, at that point in time, and they had wonderful outcomes with regards to keeping visual acuity at 2025 or 2020, but yet losing all of their peripheral visual field. And this is a great example of a patient here who has proliferative diabetes, 42-year-old female, hemoglobin A1C is 7.9. She's 2025. She's a mild amount of macular edema here. Definitely not at the threshold where you treat her but potentially, but yet with anti-VEGF therapy, we can restore uh, the amount of um, uh, fluorescein angiography leakage, as well as the uh, restore the the contour to the retina in this sort of population of patients over time. So the real question becomes is how do we handle patients with proliferative disease with and without DME in the era of anti-VEGF? And that's what protocol S really looked at. 
was to look at this five-year outcome of patients randomized to receiving either panrenal laser or anti-VEGF for the treatment of proliferative disease. Now, uh, I, I can tell you one of the big drawbacks of this study, because really it, it didn't answer the question we wanted to answer, was that eyes with or without center involving DME were eligible. And obviously if those patients were getting center involved DME, they were allowed to get anti-VEGF during the course of the study. Uh, and the treatment criteria was the same between the two groups. Essentially you're looking at the amount of size or amount of neovascularization that increased in both groups, yet the ranibizumab group got a bunch of loading doses ahead of time. This was actually a five year trial, which was good to see the kind of data that we expect to see but look at the bottom here for just a moment. And just remember again, this is not a head-to-head -head, head -head study of laser versus anti-VEGF. 22 patients actually had um, uh, DME at baseline. And so they required anti-VEGF. So really the PRP group, a lot of them were developing, getting uh, anti-VEGF and the ranibizumab group, um, you know, obviously was getting the anti-VEGF for DME alongside the treatment of of um, proliferative disease. And here's the final outcome of the study, which showed again that there was an improvement in patients with baseline DME, obviously in anti-VEGF, but without, anti without baseline DME, the uh, visual results were kind of equivocal. But again, I will tell you that the PRP group here also received uh, some anti-VEGF as they went along, because even if you did that baseline DME and you developed DME as this trial continued, you were eligible to get anti-VEGF as that went on, and that was not an uncommon situation. So just the two-year outcomes showed a superiority of visual acuity uh, with regards to ranibizumab or anti-VEGF treatment, less peripheral visual field loss, threefold less vitrectomies, and um, it's cost-effective when DME was present. But again, PRP was favored because it had fewer visits, fewer injections, and was cost-effective when DME was not present. They went out to uh, five years. And again, you can see that very good trend that we saw amongst many studies where we saw a, a decrease in anti-VEGFs as the trial went on, which was very, very reassuring. And again, you see that the number of, um, of, of treatments outside this condition are very low. The end of the trial essentially showed an equivalence as far as the visual acuity. But one thing people forget about the study was that they looked at this, this graph and this slide, and they say, well, the patients in the anti-VEGF arm still lost vision, or, or lost visual field, I should say. And actually, this was statistically different from each other. These were, this is, the p-value was less than 0.05 in this group. So yes, there is progressive ischemia in our diabetic patients, but it is, um, it is still better at peripheral visual field-wise than those patients who were receiving um, PRP as a result of that. And again, the two-step retinopathy improvements in anti-VEGF were not seen in the PRP group because of the fact that they did get that. Uh, very equivalent numbers of, of side effects seen here. Uh, again, the vitrectomy rates were lower, yet the vitreous hemorrhage rates were really quite significant. So over five years, again, you know, we saw a relatively uh, nice uh, improvement in patients who had DME at baseline. And again, PRP was favored for fewer injections and fewer visits. But how do we do it in real practice? Well, this is really a blended approach. It, it's a blended approach of if DME is present, we treat with anti-VEGF clearly. But even if DME is not present, I, a lot of us treat with anti-VEGF in and between our PRP treatments in clinical practice today. And that's been reflected in a lot of the ASRS data as well. I'll just quickly walk you through protocol T. And I think it's important to show you some findings from this study. Uh, protocol T compared patients with aflibercept, bevacizumab, and ranibizumab on a head-to-head -head basis. But what they did essentially was found that uh, aflibercept was superior in, in many fashions along the primary endpoint, showing you the uh, improvement in visual acuity, but also with secondary endpoints as well. Uh, obviously, if vision is 2040 or better, uh, that uh, fell off. And so all the drugs were essentially equivalent in practice. And again, looking at that two-year outcome, you saw that same improvement. And here you can see, again, as vision got worse, you see that um, improvement in visual acuity as, as time went on, especially with the flibercept over controls. But all three anti-VEGFs were considered effective uh, for vision 2040 or better. That was sort of the takeaway. But here is a graph I can show you, and I'll show you this graph. It's kind of busy, but in this lower left corner here, look at this uh, breakout of patients with 400 microns or thicker retinas and comparisons between Avastin, Lucentis, and ILEA. Even in good vision states, 
Avastin performed much poorer, almost five letters poorer than Lucentis and ILEA in this group. So for those patients who have that, you know, uh, increased retinal thickness, we would use uh, obviously and either Lucentis or ILEA in those patients uh, for the treatment of DME, even despite the fact their vision might be 20, 40 or better. And let me just stop, uh, start, uh, finish up with this study, which is the, obviously the protocol V good vision study, which looked at the management of patients with good visual acuity. Whether you observe them laser than this patient has 20, 20 visual acuity. What should I do in this case? And that's what protocol V really looked at. It looked at the uh, change in visual acuity in those who got prompt anti-VEGF or prompt laser and deferred anti-VEGF or observation only, and found essentially that they had uh, very equivalent uh, changes in retinal thickness. So the conclusion was that you could wait on these patients until they got worse and then treat them if that's the case. Well, the problem here is uh, the following. You have a limited timeline of up to two years. Uh, you have healthy patients, 7.1 A1C was most of the patients in the study. And you had to have good patients and motivated patients to be within a clinical study. This is not real world. And so for what we found essentially is that there's a definite risk factor for progression in patients with uh, the eyes in protocol V. Uh, for example, if your fellow eye was receiving anti-VEGF, you had a 2.5 fold greater likelihood of progressing. If you have eyes with severity score greater than 47 to moderate severe non-proliferative disease, or if you have baseline CST greater than 300 microns, you're a twofold greater to progress. And so that's where I think this is a very important study to look at and to, to evaluate. So just to conclude my talk today, I think the Retina Network has done fantastic studies with regards to diabetic patients. They've expanded the scope now to encompass all retinal diseases. It's a highly experienced infrastructure. They're looking at many protocols. Even you all today watching can suggest protocols to the DRCR net, and uh, they will work with protocols in the United States. And they have many ongoing studies looking for more innovative trials as we go forward. And again, um, this is looking at many different uh, retinal conditions. And I think that they, we owe a set of gratitude to what the DRCR net provided, albeit I think that there's some real world implications to the studies and what they're doing. Thank you very much.